Well, welcome back to the Ask Podcast, the first one of the new year. And Greg, Happy New Year to you. And to you, David. Great to great to talk to you again. Yeah, and we were. Um, I, I'm saying we were doing a, a chapter at a time, but we we got so engrossed last time in culture that I thought I'd come back to you with culture. And I've been thinking about this, and I've got a question for you. Why is it invariably that when people want to betray religious people who are Christians, it's often Catholics? And why are I, and I'm not saying, by the way, that's a bad thing because it often takes the heat off us, but <laughs> Protestants. But um, why why are Catholic priests such dramatic material? Well, David, uh, <clears throat> um, good questions, which I can't really answer, but I'll offer a couple of thoughts. Um, I think often when people are thinking of religious people in the West, they do uh, cite um, American evangelical pastors quite a lot. Yeah. Um, that's a that's a trope or a type that is very visible. I think part of it is just visual. You know that the uh, Catholic nuns used to wear very distinctive habits and Catholic priests used to wear very distinctive clerical gear. The only time it seems to me now you see a priest wearing clerical gear is when it's a left-wing priest going to a protest, uh, a left-wing protest march, and he wants... He wouldn't wear clerical gear from one decade to the next, but he wants to show he's, uh, he's a priest protesting against... Um, but I, I, I jest. Um, clerical mm -hmm. gear is making a bit of a comeback amongst, uh, amongst Catholic priests. So I think the visual symbolism is part of it. And um, I guess the, uh, the cultural presence of the papacy. But uh, I, I don't know, really... Um, uh, and, of course, the, you know, let's not shy away from it either. The um, sexual abuse scandals of recent times, which have um, disproportionately figured Catholic priests, probably give the culture, a, you know, a, a good whipping boy to whip, whip all Christians with. Yeah, OK. I, yeah, I, I get that. I mean, I just I, I think part of it for me is also that um, Catholicism tends to be more visual. And also there's a, in general, a more popular um, folk culture around it as well. Whereas, and I, you know, I guess American evangelicals quite often tend to be portrayed as kind of, you know, redneck ignoramuses, um, you know, and they're, they're easy to, to... Well, I think the popular culture is pretty hostile to all, all Bible-based, gospel-based Christianity. Yeah. And it's going to pick a stereotype and a caricature yeah. of each of each one so the ridiculous uh, tv version of the father brown series has father brown gk chesterton's priest detective yeah as a as a kind of modernist left liberal cleric who doesn't believe in miracles and who thinks the church has been the enemy of science well gk yeah. chesterton himself and his priest father brown were absolute took the absolutely opposite view from that, and yet both Chesterton and his priest were sophisticated uh, intellects. Mm -hmm. um, so similarly, you know, American evangelicals, for all their, whatever their failings, they are the most generous philanthropic givers in the Western world. So if you wanted to look at the people who really care about social justice or the, the plight of the poor or something, you would, you would look at the charitable giving of American evangelicals. But if you want to, if you want to whip the church, you'll find some sort of, um, you know, redneck fundamentalist uh, over-the-top caricature uh, to lampoon. I, I watched a television program uh, based on the Archie Andrews comics, um, Riverdale or something, yeah. and it had a group of nuns in it who it turned out eventually had disaffiliated themselves from the church. But these were keeping girls prisoner to torture them. Now, how often do you think that happens with contemporary nuns? But it allowed this TV show to show women in uh, nuns' habits and so on. It was an utter shocking, grotesque defamation of Christianity, but that's kind of what you expect in popular culture. And using the visual the visual props is, uh, is a big part of it. it. It ought to, by the way, tell us on the positive side how powerful vi uh, visual symbols are. I mean, there's a reason people built cathedrals and... Uh, you know, display crosses and so on. The Chinese Communist Party, like the liberal culture in the West, doesn't like churches to have crosses on them. It, it wants to get rid of the visual symbols of Christianity. 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting because you mentioned a book that I hadn't heard of, uh, which was, what was it? It's about a priest. Um, uh, and I can't remember what the book was. It was about, you, 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 yeah, you compared it with, uh, eat, pray, love. And you said it was kind of a, an, an exotic romance. Um, it's called, called the monk downstairs. The monk downstairs. Yeah. Tell me about that. Yeah. So that's interesting because mostly the popular culture is hostile to Christianity, although the chapter about popular culture contains a good bit of positive pro-Christian material in the popular culture. But a particular way now the popular culture is dealing with Christianity is to present such a bowdlerized version of Christianity, the Christianity mm -hmm. stripped of its divine elements, stripped of its genuine transcendence, and certainly stripped of its moral code, so that Christianity, the message of Christianity becomes, do what thou will, but do it kindly. And uh, the monk downstairs, the plot is fairly straightforward. It's quite a well-written novel. It's a, 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 you know, good, entertaining novel. The plot is a Catholic uh, monk, a priest, leaves his order, leaves his monastery, leaves a life of contemplative prayer, rents a basement in a divorcee's house, quickly uh, falls into bed with her, has an affair with her. Before that, he's full of angst and unhappiness. After that, he's tremendously happy. And he remains a transcendent, meditative Christian monk. Now, I absolutely accept that lots of priests uh, abandon their vows or uh, you know, have adulterous affairs or, or whatever it might be. But the particular argument of this book is that you can do that without any injury to your Christian faith. So I, I cite another TV series um, about uh, about three women as well, where the the message is that Christianity is just just a feel good thing. Uh, so just behave as you will. I mean, don't murder people and so on. But short of that, it makes no uh -huh. moral claim on you, no lifestyle claim on you, nothing at all. Certainly no claim in, in sexual morality, nothing like that. Do whatever you like, but just feel good about yourself and, um, and uh, do it with a smile and you'll be a good Christian. So in the monk downstairs, the monk continues to pray uh, to practice meditation of the type that you see in that movie and book, Eat, Pray, Love. In other words, a completely non-spiritual, non-Christian kind of meditation, really. Mm -hmm. Has his adulterous affair, is perfectly happy about that, breaks all the kinds of rules of the Catholic Church regarding sacraments and so on. And, and he's held up in the book as an ideal contemporary Christian. Mm -hmm. Now, he's certainly not a mass murderer or anything, but this is one way that popular culture is trying to get rid of Christianity by, by just saying... Christianity can be acceptable, provided it has nothing at all confrontational or um, normative or uh, critical to say about contemporary liberal culture. Yeah, I mean, it's interesting because I, I think there's a couple of factors in here. One is it's so much easier dramatically to portray badness. So, you know, the, yes. you, you find, was it Kevin Costner's Robin Hood? Well, the sheriff of Nottingham, as Alan Rickman, was brilliant, you know, and, and, and I think it's, it's difficult to portray goodness without it in today's society appearing prudish. Um, I think novels can do that easier than films, um, but some can do it. I, I was thinking of the film um, Terence Malick's A Hidden Life, which basically portrays a Catholic farmer who stands up to Hitler and, you know, was executed. Uh, and within that, you've got people within the church who, who are, the bishop is horrendous, but the uh, one of the priests is fine and so on. And it's a much more sympathetic portrayal. But I, I hadn't read that book, so I thought that that was absolutely uh, fascinating. And you also talk about Graham Greene and Evelyn Waugh and, you know, Brideshead Revisited and these kind of, of classic ones. Um, when you start listing things, it... It's quite amazing how many Christian or Christian influenced great writers there were in the 20th century, which, I, again, I, when I thought about it, was a bit surprising for me. Yeah, the 20th century was a tremendous, uh, the second half, well, say from the 1930s onwards, there was a huge 
Christian literary revival. Certainly Graham Greene, Evelyn Waugh, Thomas Merton, you know, who became a um, Cistercian, a Trappist monk. His his spiritual memoir, The Seven-Sided Mountain, sold three million copies almost, uh, mm-hmm. you know, shortly after it was published. Um, a couple of points, so just a couple of shafts of light to throw on that. Your point about it being easier to present good uh, badness rather than goodness in literature and art, I think is actually true. It's very challenging mm-hmm. to present um, steady goodness. I think you can present heroic goodness in a single moment. So you can make a, a film about a war hero who sacrifices his life to save his comrades or something like that. What is extraordinarily difficult for art to deal with is steady goodness. The way goodness is lived out by most people in the world is steady goodness. Mm -hmm. It's the father or mother who is always reliable, Mm -hmm. who is always responsible, who is always loving to wayward wayward children. It's the spouse who resists temptation and is is faithful to their vows, who who, um, takes the responsibility of providing for their family very seriously, who is always kind, who is generous. This is extraordinarily difficult uh, for the arts to portray. And I do give a few examples of it in this chapter. So in, I think Evelyn Moore's greatest book is not Brideshead Revisited, although that's good. It's rather the Sword of Honor trilogy. And it concerns a guy named Guy Crouchback who's a bit at a loose end and he, he is redeemed, in a sense, by his efforts in World War II. But the most interesting character in it, from my point of view, is Guy's father who is a steadily good person. And Evelyn Waugh was a terribly misanthropic, difficult, drunken, disagreeable person. You know, one of his friends said to him, Evelyn, how can you claim to be a Christian? You're so horrible. And he said, well, imagine if I wasn't a Christian, you'd scarcely recognise me as a human being. I'd be so much worse. And, uh, and he was mainly attracted to characters who were a bit crackpot like him. And, of course, that's the interesting character. The more crackers you are, the more interesting you are for literature, you know. But in Guy's father, um, uh, Gerva- uh, Mr. Crouchback Sr., you get the first half of the book is a dialogue, in a sense, between the father and the son. And the son, even though he's a good man, he wants to win the war and he wants to, um, you know, reestablish the power of the church and everything. And Crouchback Sr. says, no, 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 that's not the way you measure the divine economy. You know, the divine economy, if a single soul comes back to God, that's that's more than justification enough for all of our efforts. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm paraphrasing it very badly. Mm-hmm. But he is the only character Evelyn War ever produced in literature who was a steady, good person without obvious psychological hang-ups. Mm-hmm. Another example of it is the recent movie, um, A Beautiful Day in the Neighbourhood, about the... Um, the, uh, I think he was Presbyterian, was he? Uh, a pastor, um, Fred Rogers, who was a, a children's broadcaster in America, played by Tom Hanks, who was nominated for an Academy Award. Now, he was a really good man. And many of my American friends of my age said he was the most important figure in their childhood after their parents. He was just a wonderfully good person. And the movie is about a hard-bitten journalist who wants to go and expose him and the obvious hypocrisy that must have, you know, lurked just behind the surface. And he finds there was no hypocrisy. Fred Rogers was just a really, a really good person. Now, that's quite hard for art to deal with because it lacks the obvious drama of, uh, of heroic, uh, heroic conflict. Mm-hmm. I mean, it, it, that is a fascinating film. And cynically, I was watching, watching it, waiting for... The, the inevitable denouement or whatever, and it didn't come. And I just thought, wow, okay, that was different. Um, yeah. You know, I, I got ahead of myself because I'm looking at your book here and uh, I, I'd forgotten you'd written this. So this is great minds think alike, okay? <laughs> because you write here, I'm not quite sure why this is, but one of the most difficult things in art is to make a normal good person interesting. Art finds evil easy to dramatize. Uh, but, that, you know, you basically go on to say that ordinary life is not so easy to dramatize. Now, I think people like Terence Malick are able to do it, but they're geniuses. But you're right. The man gives his children baked beans on toast for tea is not great television. Man tortures his child it is dramatic <laughs> television. You know, that's right. So it, it's um, 
Yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, I, that that's just a, that's a that says a, a great deal uh, about us. But one thing I do want want to come on to. Sorry. Well, before we go, come on to, do you want to add anything to to that? Well, when you think about that, David, in a way, it kind of makes intuitive sense because God is in goodness and God is mystery and transcendence and depth mm -hmm. and his integration. And of course, that's much, much more challenging for a feeble human artist to present than the false glamour of evil, mm -hmm. which which is tawdry and superficial and and simple mm -hmm. compared to the profundity of goodness. Mm -hmm. And uh, artists who only deal in evil are taking the easy way out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I, I do think that. Now, we I, I don't care if we take the rest of this podcast discussing this, because they say that the world is divided into those who have read Lord of the Rings and those who are going to read it. Um, <laughs> Um, I'm assuming you've read the book as well as seen the films? Of course, yes, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah absolutely. Yeah, now I'm very devoted to the book, absolutely. Yeah. It is a work of unbelievable genius, is, is the only way I can describe it. I, I, I have a confession to make, so I'll treat you like my priest. Um, I hadn't actually read Lord of the Rings until about four years ago. Uh, I'd seen the films and everything else, and I'd read The Hobbit, but Lord of the Rings it blew me away the the depth the the writing that you, you're getting caught up in the story the creation of separate worlds what is it about tolkien that makes him special and what was wrong with that dreadful film about tolkien well tolkien is an extraordinary person and david for you not to have read it until four years ago what a what a kindness of god that was to you because it kept for your early middle age one of the great delights you know, even the more remarked that he hadn't he hadn't read Henry James until middle age, mm -hmm. and he thought this was just an unbelievable kindness to to wait until middle age to discover the beauty of this. So Tolkien was uh, uh, a believing Christian to the core of his being. He was the central individual involved in the conversion of C.S. Lewis to Christianity. They were the best of friends at Oxford. Tolkien had a very strange life. He was brought up by priests. His, his mother died when he was uh, about uh, 11 or 12, and she left him as the ward of a priest who, who looked after him and his brother, put them in a boarding house just near the, the presbytery, and the, the, the Tolkien boys went there for breakfast every morning and went there after school every afternoon for, um, you know, afternoon tea and to do their homework and so on. And, uh, and the, the Christian faith was absolutely central to every element of Tolkien's being. And of course, he wrote The Lord of the Rings, initially uh, growing out of The Hobbit, which he'd written for his sons or for his kids. And uh, the, it's, not a, um, it's not an allegory. It's not an easy biblical allegory, but the, the divine consciousness suffuses it all the way through. So it is uh, a book about the conflict between good and evil. The Christian element of the book is everywhere. So evil is personified, Sauron. Mm -hmm. Sauron is very much Satan. Mm -hmm. uh, evil is an active, you know, personal presence in the world. The world is rescued not by the great King Aragorn, but by the humble halfling hobbit Frodo. Mm -hmm. But Tolkien's sense of the complex moral nature of humanity is evident in the great climax where Frodo, although he is the best, bravest, most thoroughly good character in the whole saga, does not himself have the moral strength at the end to surrender the ring. The ring has to go into the fire of Mordor for the world to be saved. And he can't do it. He can't let go mm -hmm. because humans cannot achieve virtue by themselves. Tolkien you know, the underlying, there have been a thousand books about the underlying theology and philosophy of, uh, of The Lord of the Rings. You don't need any of this to read it. I mean, it's a great, great novel, great story. But in the end, the ring goes into the fire because the evil little character Gollum, in his selfishness, tries to grab it from Frodo and falls into the fire. Mm -hmm. And uh, Tolkien is really saying that a human being, so the hobbits are, you know, morally human beings, 
cannot achieve this heroic goodness by themselves. They need divine intervention. The, you know, the orcs are fallen elves as the devils are fallen angels. The wizard Gandalf is the guardian angel figure. I mean, the biblical imagery, the Christian imagery, and Tolkien himself said the book is really, in the end, about coming to grips with death mm -hmm. because um, Bilbo and the elves sail off to the afterlife uh, at the end of the saga. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is such a rich book. And Tolkien, of course, one of the great intellectuals of the 20th century, professor of philology at Oxford University, um, and, you know, a super genius, really. Wonderful guy. And th this terrible movie about him, the worst movie I've ever seen in, in my life about anything, whites out his Christianity. I mean, I've written, I think, in that chapter, it treats Christianity the way Queen Victoria responded to lesbianism. Mm -hmm. She'd heard of it, but she didn't really believe it existed, mm -hmm. you know. And Tolkien himself, uh, in his private discussions, and, you know, he had a deep, deep friendship with C.S. Lewis and some other authors, and they were always talking these things over. And he had wonderful correspondence with his sons and with a lot of readers of Lord of the Rings. And he's quite, um, he's open, he's not proselytising, but he's quite open about the Christian nature of his novel and to to consider Tolkien who wrote the best-selling novel of the 20th century one of the great creative works in human history and not consider his Christian inspiration is just bananas I think yeah it is bananas and I think it reveals a kind of um, prejudice I mean I, I do have to say that the films did much better you know I, I i thought the films were pretty good portrayals yeah, uh, yeah. or you know of of the book and i think you can get it you can get the films without knowing christianity but i think when you know christianity the films make a whole lot more sense because that's the canvas on which the film and the book you know that well it's a, it's a canvas on which the book is written isn't it absolutely yeah a hundred percent and it's full of the most wonderful aphorisms. Um, you know, uh, one of the most terrifying scenes in Lord of the Rings is where the, the Night Riders first appear, the Nazgul. Oh, yeah. And uh, that, that was so frightening. I remember reading that as a teenager the first time I read the book. And, I mean, I couldn't go to sleep. I had to read on for another 100 pages or something because it was so terrifying. It was so, so Tolkien's technical accomplishment as a writer is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. But at about that time, Frodo meets Aragorn. Who is who then goes under the name of Strider. And Aragorn is a kind of a Moses like figure in Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. He becomes the great king but and leads his people back. But at the time, Strider looks scruffy and the hobbits are very worried that he might be a bad guy. And Frodo makes a judgment. The words are something like, If you were really bad, I think you would look fairer and seem fouler. Mm. And what a wonderful line that is, you know. So you'd, Strider looks foul but seems fair, and he would be the reverse if he were really evil. And, you know, Lord of the Rings is a thousand pages long. There's, there's a phrase of re equal acuity on, on almost every page, I think. Yeah, I mean, I just find, I mean, I didn't, I, I, I'll just show you this. I, for those who are listening, I'm showing up my folio edition of uh, the, <laughs> the three things of the Lord of the Rings. And I... I normally highlight books, you know, put lots of, but these are untouched. Uh, partly because it would be a completely rainbow book. There's so many memorable yes. phrases. And I think, in fact, one of the things I might do is I might start a Twitter account which just goes through the Lord of the Rings with all the wee <laughs> phrases. But it's just, you know, it's, it's a great example of what you're talking about, bringing Christianity into popular culture. Who would have thought that a Catholic writer's explicitly theological novel would be not only the best-selling book of the 20th century but all three of them are in the top 20 uh, best-selling films as well which is a remarkable uh, achievement can i just say uh, before we go you know you mentioned tolkien's letters and i did read some of his letters to his son particularly at marriage which i thought was absolutely wonderful but I love this quote, and I'll let you comment on it. He wrote to his grandson, Michael. This is, again, quoting from your book. He wrote, I have met stuffy, stupid, undutiful, conceited, ignorant, hypocritical, lazy, tipsy, hard-hearted, cynical, mean, grasping, vulgar, snobbish, and even at a guess, immoral priests in the course of my peregrinations. But for me, 
One Father Francis outweighs them all. I first learned charity and forgiveness from him. What a marvellous quote. Well, it is wonderful. Father Francis is the priest who brought him up, and he did a great job. And uh, every year he would take Tolkien and his brother on a holiday, and, you know, he raised funds from his own family to supplement Tolkien at Oxford University because Tolkien won a scholarship, but it didn't pay all of his expenses and so on. And this is one of the central relationships of Tolkien's life. Um, I recommend the volume of Tolkien's correspondence. Yeah. I, I even have a proposal for Christians, which they should do, but no, no one has taken me up on it, and I'm not proposing to do it myself. The, the volume of Tolkien's correspondence was published in the 1980s. It's quite a large volume. Most of it is about Lord of the Rings, as you'd expect. But Tolkien never entered public controversy, so he has some wonderful letters to C.S. Lewis where he, you know, disagrees with Lewis on some point or other of theology and pulls him up and says, no, no, you've misunderstood this and so on. They were great friends. They were, they were the best of friends. And then they, they became a little estranged. They never became on bad terms, but a little less close. But his letters to C.S. Lewis and his letters to his sons, in, especially in wartime, are, are tremendously direct about spiritual and theological matters. So he's advising one of his sons who's about to get married. But this marriage is a serious business. You have to get hold of yourself. Marriage takes a lot of discipline. You've got to be faithful to your wife, and that's against your instinct. And you've got to think this through, and you've got to pray about it all the time. He gives advice to his sons about how to pray if they can't get to church. Mm -hmm. He gives advice to his sons in the midst of battle, who are going into battle, about asking for the uh, assistance of their guardian angel and so on. Now, he never did any of this stuff in public because in his own peculiar way, Tolkien was an immensely modest man. Mm -hmm. He didn't try to enter controversies. He didn't send letters to the editor of the Times. He wouldn't talk about um, political issues or anything like that. But I think a wonderful Christian project would be to extract from the seven or 800 pages of his correspondence, or possibly a bit less than that, the 100 pages or the 150 pages which deal with explicitly Christian matters and get this great mind uh, giving advice on prayer, on his own experience. Um, you know, when he retired, his wife had never really adapted that well to Oxford life, and she loved being in Brighton for holidays. Mm -hmm. So they moved to live in, in a, maybe not Brighton, but in a seaside British hotel. He did that to oblige his wife, <laughs> took him away from Oxford, all the things that he loved, all the, you know, where he was an esteemed professor and a worldwide celebrity and everything. Mm -hmm. But he did it in service to his wife. Mm -hmm. And uh, his appreciation of his wife, some of the most beautiful passages in his, his private writings are about his wife, the long, faithful marriage that they had. And I think, you know, Christians do revere Tolkien, but I think he's an underused resource. I'd love to take the 100 pages about Christianity out of his letters and just publish a little book, Tolkien on Christianity. And uh, I think it would be a terrific encouragement to, to people, really. Well, you, you've persuaded me, so I'm now going to go and have to go and find that book of letters <laughs> <laughs> so that I will, you know, that I can read it. Um, I'm, I, yeah, I'm going to, uh, we'll finish off here. Um, let's, the phrase you say in, in, I don't think Christians make enough of Tolkien's Christianity, uh, you've already said what you would want us to do with that. But, you know, there are other people. I, I feel one of the problems in 21st century culture, even as opposed to 20th century popular culture in the West, is that Christians are a little bit more scared, uh, a little bit don't want to be outed. Um, I, I wonder, you know, C.S. Lewis could go on the BBC, for example, in the, during the Second World War. Mere Christianity comes out of that. Tolkien had no problems. They could both lecture at major universities, of course. Um, I wonder if you want to say anything about just this general theme of Christians in popular culture. Do you think it, it is possible to be open um, without being aggressive in, in the way that Tolkien, Tolkien wasn't aggressive, but he was certainly very open, wasn't he? Yes, David. I, I think that's one of the central challenges of our age. And honestly, one of the reasons I've written these two books, uh, whatever their, you know, merits or failings, mm -hmm. is because I want to encourage Christians to come out. Now, 
there are certain circumstances in which the culture is so hostile that if you come out as a Christian, you will face serious professional repercussions. But we are not suffering persecution in the way Christians in China or Egypt or Pakistan routinely do. And uh, there's certainly no need to be aggressive, but I do think Christians should be open about their beliefs. I mean, partly the culture has bluffed us into being embarrassed about our belief. Partly the, the failure in our own education means that we're, we don't know how to defend ourselves against obvious foolish attacks, you know, that the Gospels are all lies or that science says that God doesn't exist or something. Partly uh, it's easier to be silent. There's a particular Australian inheritance, you know, we used to have a long period where Protestants and Catholics argued all the time, so we decided to all shut up about it. But that, that period is so long and gone now. Protestants and Catholics are the best friends now. Mm -hmm. they're, they're each other's only allies. And uh, that old secularism in Australia is, um, is no, longer, no longer relevant. Mm -hmm. And I wish that, you know, Christianity is nothing to be ashamed about. Let's be true, you know. So maybe once there was a time when Christians were too proud and boastful and the sin of hypocrisy and moral arrogance and swagger was a besetting sin and they needed to be uh, brought low because of that besetting sin. Mm -hmm. That is not the time now. We will help people by giving them a path to the truth and we will express solidarity with fellow Christians and we'll make a new access point for Christ in the culture if we simply are willing to talk about it occasionally. And, uh, you know, you don't need to have all the answers. You don't need to make it your, your, your main single thing. But I, I would really encourage Christians, and that's one reason I pursued all these politicians in the last book, and kind of, made, kind of made them own up to their Christianity. God bless them, they did, you know, they did very willingly. Because, um, you know, it's, it's a wholly positive thing. And the, the final reflection is, if we live our lives well enough, then, um, then the culture will take notice of us, and, uh, and we shouldn't be shy about saying uh, what our inspiration is. And if we make a mess of our lives, as we're likely to, then we're, we're in need of God's mercy and we shouldn't be scared of, uh, of asking for that either. So yeah. that's a bit of an incoherent jumble of thoughts, but I would love to encourage all Christians to just come out in the general way uh, openly about their beliefs. Greg, thank you so much. Um, in, in so many ways, I, I would love to reflect more on that, but our, our time has gone. I'll give you advance notice of what we're going to do in a couple of weeks' time uh, uh, or maybe longer, uh, and that is... Um, Gilead, because again, I think that I find it fascinating that that's one of the books. And of course, we, we have to do uh, John Buchan, the uh, Scotsman, <laughs> who, who the Presbyterian Cavalier, the Presbyterian Cavalier. And he was a, he was a free churchman as well. He was my denomination, actually. Well, his his father was a, a free church minister. But um, it, it is really fascinating looking at all of this. And I, I appreciate your own contribution in terms of the popular culture as well through this book. So uh, thank you for it. And I look forward to chatting to you again in a couple of weeks. Thanks so much, David. Great to talk to you. Thanks very much indeed. Right. Now, David, should I have...